All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Faree. Uh, thanks for, for joining um, Lead Generation Week in this specific session, Lead Management and Distribution in the New Era. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to do a quick thanks to our sponsors for allowing us uh, or helping us put this event on. We got Leadspedia, Drips, and Fluent. Um, I also want to um, make note of a couple um, instructions. If uh, We always want you guys to participate in all these sessions, and if you've attended the previous ones, you'll know you, you've already heard this, but if you haven't, um, there's two ways to ask uh, questions. Um, probably the best way is by clicking on the little icon in the video there that says um, Q&A. You can click on that, type in the questions, the panelists will see them, but you can also use your app. Um, there's a session Q and A uh, section to the right there if you're on your desktop, um, and you can ans uh, ask the questions there, and we'll go ahead and uh, answer them as well. And you can, you know, write in those uh, questions at any point through the session. Um, so, uh, but please do. Uh, no, no question is dumb, and so we'd love to hear them all. Um, so, without further ado, let's uh, bring in um, both of our um, uh, presenters today. We've got Scott Payne. Uh, the founder of SDP Solutions, and Hector Galicia from Ellie May. Scott, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Mike, so much for having us. We're so excited to be here uh, with me and Hector to talk about uh, lead distribution in the new era. And what is the new era? We're going to get to that. Obviously, there's a lot going on in the world right now, and we're all in a new era. So we're going to get into some of those things that uh, we're all experiencing today. I uh, want to first introduce myself. I'm Scott Payne. I'm the CEO of SDP Solutions, uh, host of the Lead Management Masterminds podcast. You can find it on all of your favorite podcasting sites. I also have with me uh, Hector Galicia from Ellie Mae. Hector, how are you doing today? Hey, good morning, everybody. Doing well. Awesome. All right. So we're going to get started, jump right in. Let's kick it over to Hector. Hector, go through the first couple of slides for us, if you will. All right. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you all had a, a good Memorial Day. Uh, weekend. It was a nice long weekend here for me and my family. Uh, so we want to start the conversation this morning talking about working from home or remote work and how, uh, while everybody is really having to do that today, it's not really necessarily a new thing. Uh, and, and what we found is that in the last 12 years, there's actually been a trend. Um, so uh, about 160% growth in the last 12 years alone in terms of working remotely. Uh, last 10 years, 91%. Last five years, 44%. So that growth has been pretty steady and who's to say where that number is going to be once we come out of this uh, pandemic. So the other thing that we wanted to look at here was uh, the, how effective um, remote work is going to be. So it's the new norm. More importantly, is it effective? And so one of the things that we looked at was how remote work actually attracts and retains talent. And so eight out of 10 U.S. workers said that they'd actually turned down a job that didn't offer this flexible schedule, so to speak. And a third of those would prioritize flexible working over having a more prestigious role, so a higher title, maybe even higher pay. Um, and, you know, one of the things from the business perspective is that remote work is great, you know, for businesses. So about 85% of businesses confirm productivity has actually increased. Um, and uh, about 77% of businesses say that uh, remote work actually lowers operating costs, right? So you don't have to necessarily have as big of a facility. Uh, you don't have to spend all the, uh, you know, uh, money for electricity and power and everything like that for, for your team. Uh, and in terms of job satisfaction, so we found that remote work actually increases job satisfaction. So about 57% uh, of U.S. workers were more likely than the average American to be satisfied uh, if they were able to work remotely. And again, about eight out of 10 remote workers experience less job stress. Now, they may have different stressors of having to work, you know, at home and juggle uh, their work-life balance, but in terms of job stress, they actually showed uh, less job stress. And, uh, you know, a study here for Upwork's uh, uh, future workforce report uh, predicted 73% of all teams will have remote workers by 2028. Now, again, some of that may have changed here with the pandemic, and that number may, may actually be a little bit higher. Uh, but Jake Schwartz, the CEO of the General Assembly, had an interesting quote here, and I think it's interesting for all of us to think about this, is that you know, getting comfortable uh, leaning into technology to replicate in-person collaboration is really the key to, to fostering productive remote work environments. And so it's not just about technology, it's also about establishing trust, making sure that you're holding people accountable, 
and fostering good collaboration. And that's critical to the success of remote work in, in your environment. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about how work from home is impacting sales. I don't know for all of those on the call, if, if I could see your hands, I would love to see hands raised for those <clears throat> who have seen an increase in sales. Everyone raise their hand because that's actually the most common thing that I've heard in speaking with lenders throughout the country is that, um, th that the results so far have been amazing. Um, they haven't seen a dip in production. Um, things have been, you know, uh, they've been, really no, no distractions really when it comes to, uh, you know, working from home now because you can't really go anywhere. Uh, and so, you know, it, as a result, they've seen that production has increased. Uh, you know, and I would say even most have not even seen it go down, right? Which is kind of uh, surprising to me being a guy who worked in a call center for a number of years. Uh, and, and, you know, it was always kind of a thing was, well, you can't really do your job from home, you'll be distracted. But, you know, as we've been forced to do it, people I've seen uh, great results. However, will that remain? And so you see my little meme over here, you know, oh, you have to work from home today. Good. You can watch the kids. So I can run errands. And as the country opens back up, the question is, is working from home going to stay uh, at the same levels of production as before? Now you're going to have distractions. You're going to have vacations that you'll be able to take again. You have kids sports, you have errands to run, all of these things. And so the question is, will sales production remain high as these daily distractions come back into your normal life? Now, we're going to show you some stuff here in a little while that we think will make sure to really help drive home the fact that production can stay up. You have to be doing these things to be, uh, to be able to work from home and, and keep that production up. Now, uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about here, uh, we've talked a little bit about so far is around technology and about how technology is essential for sales team. And I like showing this image here because, uh, you know, this is uh, part of a presentation I did back in Denver and talked about how different generations were adopting technology. Um, you know, back five, 10 years ago, you had the boomer population who really struggled adapting to new technology, and that's since changed. Um, and so the key with this is that you got to make sure that you have technology that's easy for people to use. Uh, and you, in order to really support that remote work, you have to be able to provide the technology um, that, that, again, everyone can use and that, uh, you know, the different generations uh, that are now working from home doing something different, they now have uh, you know, the ability to do so with, with a little bit of ease than, than maybe what it is at uh, the office. And so the key thing here too also is that, uh, you know, this is super important from being able to recruit and retain your top talent. Um, you know, one thing that I'm hearing a lot of uh, out in the industry is that, uh, you know, this is now going to be the next kind of recruiting tool. Um, if you have a, you know, direct consumer call center, in, and you offer the ability to work from home part of the time, that's going to be a key, you know, key thing in the recruiting path as you're talking to, to potential uh, loan officers coming on board is what do you offer from a work from home perspective, which was never really even thought of in a call center environment. It was always, you have to be in the office, but we're seeing that, that shift happen. So, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things to talk about the technology is you've really got to stay focused on the things that are important to how to convert leads. And, and these are some of the stats. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen uh, these things before, but you know, none of this has changed. Customers are still finding online inquiries uh, that need to be responded to immediately. Um, you know, nearly 50% of, of sales today go to the companies that respond first, right? So it's still critical that even if you're working from home, you've still got to have the technology that, that allows you to be that first to respond. You can't have things in the middle that would slow that down. Now, unfortunately, only 7% of companies actually respond within the first five minutes to an, to an inquiry, which is crazy to me today, but it still happens. Uh, and it leaves really a lot of room for your customers to go out and continue to shop uh, with other, other competitors of yours. Now, also, persistence is, is really key in this landscape um, because 50% of all sales are happening after five contact attempts. Most reps are still giving up after one or two attempts on leads which is not going to be uh, successful long-term. So, um, and, and last but not least, I'll just mention that, you know, we're still finding that nearly one third of all leads are never even called at all, which is just nuts. You got to make sure you have the technology in place. that's going to be, a, you know, a, allow you to, to be the first to respond, to follow up within five minutes, to make more than two attempts. All of these things are critical to success and the technology you have in a work from home situation is critical to that. So obviously that's a lot of missed revenue. What are some of the solutions sector? What do you, what, 
what do you have for us today? Yeah, so the first that we've seen uh, organizations you know, do a really good job of is implementing some sort of call screener. And, and you can really begin to think about your call screener as your quarterback. Um, and so it's a front end specialist who really takes the lead and essentially throws it to the right person who can do what they do best. And so if you're handing that off or throwing that over to a, a salesperson, it's really selling, right? So your salespeople need to be hyper focused on really carrying things to the finish line. Um, and so we're going to try to play a, a commercial here for you with uh, Yeah, since I'm a Cowboys fan, we're going to have to to play this video here. Let's see if we can get play. ESPN, how can I help you? John Anderson is at extension 5634. There you go. Stan, got a message for you. Production meeting, 2 o'clock. Go, okay. Tony. That's great. Good, good, uh, good commercial there. You got to love those ESPN commercials. Um, so, you know, a few takeaways from that. I think it's a good illustration of, you know, call screeners in, in the work environment and how they can assist you. So, you know, call in number one, and Scott just talked about this, calling leads immediately, you know, screening them and then really transferring them, uh, you know, to, uh, to a salesperson without the customer ever really understanding or knowing they're put on hold and going through some sort of transfer. Uh, and so, you know, the, some of the metrics that Scott showed earlier is that, you know, 50% of sales uh, just simply go to the company that called first. I mean, that's just a, you know, a crazy stat. And I know it's one that's been around for a number of years, but organizations continually struggle with that. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why in just a little bit. Uh, and, and, you know, only about 7% of companies even call within the first five minutes, uh, which is, you know, a you know, crazy stat. Um, in terms of the transfer, so, you know, longer wait times uh, start to create friction, uh, you know, for customers. And, and a lot of times the transfer takes a long time simply because the, the person doing the transfer, the screener, uh, needs to like look up somebody who's available or IM them and they get them on the phone and then bridge that call together. And so what we want to do is implement something that would actually reduce that friction uh, for, uh, for a transfer. And so uh, what we've seen work well in the past is something referred to as no hold transfer. Uh, so it allows the, the call screener to have a fluid conversation with the customer you know, qualify them, make sure that they're actually looking to, uh, in, to uh, get some information about your product and services. And if they're not, if they're calling in for some sort of customer service uh, request or some sort of you know, operations request, that that can go to the respective team and, and we give that customer you know, a, a good experience. All the meanwhile, not taking time away from your salespeople. So that no whole transfer will allow us to qualify and then actually transfer through uh, some sort of distribution method without the customer ever being placed on hold. Uh, at that point, you know, the, the loan officer that actually wins the record will be placed on hold and they're lying in wait uh, and, and just you know, kind of waiting to, to uh, kind of get a taste of uh, having the conversation with the borrower there. Uh, so kind of reverse that dynamic just a little bit. Uh, you know, another thing that call screeners or, or these uh, you know, friends can actually assist with is making sure that scheduled meetings are followed up correctly. One of the biggest things that we see over and over again is a salesperson will schedule a time with the customer and say it's 3.30 on a Monday and 3.20, 3.25 rolls around and all of a sudden that salesperson gets busy with another customer or they get busy with some sort of issue that they have to address right away. The priority for the callback for that in, in initial customer all of a sudden gets deprioritized and you know that customer is going to be lucky if they get a call. Maybe the customer calls back to the salesperson. Maybe the salesperson and the customer never get in touch with each other again, and that chase continues. And so, where the call screener can actually come into play is actually following up with the customers that have had meetings scheduled with your your salesperson. They can either make that initial attempt, or for whatever reason it's passed, a few minutes or whatnot. Call screener can pick up the ball and and and, and take things uh, you know from there. The other thing is that we want to call scheduled events or, or scheduled meetings more than once, you know, maybe even more than twice. You know, this is a, a time that we scheduled with the customer. Their time is very valuable. If for whatever reason they missed the first call, let's try and try again. One thing to mention, Hector, real quick for you. Um, you know, I think as he talked about the you no know, hold transfer situation, <clears throat> and he had mentioned that you go out and try to find an agent to take the call. Um, and they're placed on a brief hold in this situation. I think the key thing with that is that you're actually sending that through in, in Velocify, what we call, uh, you know, Shotgun Connect. Uh, and Shotgun Connect essentially is, is creating a race between agents to take that transfer. So the first person to pick up their phone and press one wins the transfer. Uh, 
you've created a race because you want to get that transfer over to the person as soon as possible. And having technology like that is really key to making this work so that you can uh, distribute in, in a strategic way, which you can do, uh, cascade through different things. But the key thing is to, is to create that shotgun piece. Also, just to touch on with the inbound piece, uh, we, we saw Tony Romo there taking an inbound call. One of the things that I'm finding more and more is that salespeople don't like taking in, incoming calls uh, to play like a uh, receptionist, right? The salesperson wants to be on the job, uh, you know, spend all of their time selling. And so if you have that inbound person uh, to take all of your inbound calls to do that screening and then get it to a salesperson in a really fast way through that no hold transfer, you really can see some increased uh, stats uh, on your conversion rates. So just to throw that out there as well for you, Hector. No, great points, great points. You know, and, and you know, the other thing that we need to think about here as well is how do we hold people accountable? And so, you know, managers have to have some sort of access to track availability of salespeople, um, whether or not they're making themselves available or not available, or if they're even on a call. And so uh, in this example here, we're showing uh, in Velocify what we refer to as the Dial IQ dashboard. And so you'd be able to see you know, how many total uh, agents, or in this case, users, are available, if they're on a call, if they're not on a call. And if, there, if, if you don't have enough people that are available for this type of transfer, then as a manager, you need to go and touch base with your team and see, do we have a scheduling problem? Uh, have people just not managed their calls button correctly? Uh, or do we need to get some other people to, to, to get on the phone to be able to take these, uh, these email calls? But this tool is great for managers. And uh, you know, one of the things that I always tell people in, you know, over the years that we've, you know, we've worked with is that we can put in a system uh, to, to manage your leads and manage your records, be some sort of, you know, CRM uh, system for your organization. But, you know, people manage people. And so it's really leveraging some of the tools within our system. So that way we can go over to some of these, you know, different people and see what's going on, make sure that we give customers and borrowers the, the best experience possible and, and try to increase, uh, you know, our, our conversion rates uh, with every, every tool that we have in our tool, tool belt. Yeah. I also just wanted to add here, especially in a work from home environment, right? You, you're not sitting next to your salespeople anymore. The managers aren't sitting there to see who's available, who's not. And so this becomes an even more critical piece to the puzzle of working from home is that you have to have visibility into are people available because you can't just look over next door uh, to see you know, who's available. And then also add here, uh, we don't have the screenshot over here, but uh, managers, I think this is critical from the call screener standpoint because they're not going to be as seasoned as your experienced salespeople. Uh, they're not going to be able to fight the objections the best way possible. Uh, just haven't learned yet. And so uh, one of the things that this tool provides, and there are many tools like this that, that will allow you to listen to phone calls live, to barge into a call, to whisper to the agent. This type of technology is critical with a call screener because, again, they're just not as seasoned yet, and they're going to need some help. So it's a way to do some live coaching. Uh, we've even done some stuff in Velocify where we've created a – a tab on the lead record where uh, a manager can rate the phone call right there on the actual lead itself so that uh, so that it's stored you could give access to the to the user to go listen to the call and listen to the the feedback and comments that the manager left on that page uh, and then it becomes a valuable tool from reporting um, you know it, I think as you uh, you know I've built with a couple clients where we'll run a report to see how many you know, eight plus score calls, eight out of 10 over the past week and, and what groups are having high and low ones based on, on that so they, they can focus the, the training in the right way. So you have it on the actual lead record itself where the phone call exists. So again, just kind of some key things for, from a call screener perspective to make sure you have that visibility because you're not going to be right next door to them anymore when they're working from home. Yeah, no, it's got a great point. And along those lines, some organizations have actually implemented a, a comp plan tailored for, for call screeners. Uh, not only in the number of transfers and, and ultimately uh, conversions on those transfers, but also the call quality. Uh, you know, so, you know, did they stay, stay true to the script? Did they say the right things? Did they um, have the, the, a good tone in, in their, you know, conversation methods? So being able to uh, screen or, or go back and listen to that call and then grade it and, and have that stamped on the lead record and then report on it is just a, a phenomenal tool uh, for your management team to be able to coach and, and, you know, increase production for your, your call screeners in the right way. All right, so now let's take a look at second point here, uh, prioritization of sales activities. So I, I love this, uh, this, this slide here uh, because, you know, we see it, uh, you know, every single day. Every salesperson that I've ever worked with has always told me they're a great multitasker. 
uh, you know, and I bet you'd find on their resume, they list that as a strength, right? Being a good multitasker. Um, and, you know, traditionally lead management systems have done a really good job of building prioritization features into their product. Uh, but historically, they've only really looked at the lead. And so we've worked with a, a number of organizations now that have started to look at incorporating this notion of like opportunities or post application or whatnot into their prioritization. And you're starting to look at the entire sales process. And so, you know, if you really start to think about it, if organizations are only prioritizing the lead, that means that most companies are relying on their salespeople to really determine how and when to follow up with potential customers, right? Someone that's started an application um, and now they've moved further into that sales process, essentially beyond the lead. And you're, you're relying on these salespeople while they're very talented, you're asking them to multi, multitask with all the different nuances that come uh, you know, after an application. If there's something wrong with the record, if they need to follow up with the customer, uh, or if for whatever reason the customer decides to change their mind, now you have to go back and reclose them. So, you know, ultimately that's just going to lead to a ton of multitasking throughout the day. And, you know, one of the things that we, we always, uh, you know, kind of harp on is this notion that uh, the, the author David Crenshaw brings up. And he really disagrees with, you know, this notion of being a good multitasker. So in his book, The Myth of Multitasking, he finds that multitasking isn't really a thing. He refers to it as switch tasking. So juggling, let's say two tasks, you know, by refocusing your attention back and forth between the two, uh, actually is, is less efficient and you start to lose time between switching, the, you know, those tasks. You have to kind of, you know, stop one task, switch back, you know, think about, you know, what, what you were doing again. And so at the end of the day, it's less efficient to, uh, to multitask in that manner. And so in a study by Velocify, this is a few years back, um, we found very similar results in terms of, uh, you know, reducing the, the need to multitask throughout the day. And so on the left side of this graph here, you'll see that if we looked at the lead, at the lead level, um, how effective prioritization was for that lead, we found a 22% increase on actions per lead, a 33% increase in content attempts per lead, and a 67% talk time increase per lead. So that's pretty astonishing there, and pretty interesting to look at, right? So, you know, more actions, more content attempts, ultimate leads, to more uh, valuable conversation time with customers, with the right customer at the right time. Um, and if you were to look at how that correlates to conversion, um, you know, this study by Velocify looked at conversion rate gains uh, based on the average of all companies that had some sort of prioritization use. So organizations that use prioritization about 50% of the time had about an 8% increase in conversion rates. Uh, those that use it about 70% of the time, about a 29% increase in conversion rates. And then look at that on the right side, 90% or organizations that use prioritization more than 90% had about a 49 or 50% increase in conversion rates. So when you start to total all this up, it, it equates about three times higher sales production and performance for organizations that do a good job of using priority or the priority view. Yeah, a couple of things just to add there, Hector. You, you touched on it, but let's expand a little bit more if we can about the entire loan process uh, being in, in, in this so-called priority view. So in Velocify, they have, you know, normal view versus priority view. Uh, you know, what we're finding really is that, as Hector mentioned, we're getting statuses back from other systems, feeding back into the to Velocify through integrations and using those data on the statuses to really uh, reprioritize uh, that loan officer's day. So it's no longer just about what leads, which is traditionally what you've had, what leads should be followed up with, but it's in conjunction with the loan. So if you have an application you've taken, but the customer hasn't sent in their docs yet, instead of going to your LOS to try to figure out, okay, what do I need to do? When should I call them? When should I follow it up? That's fed back into the system so that you can then prioritize following up on your applications, which may be more important than calling a lead for the second time that hasn't answered yet. And so as you start to weave all of this together, um, you know, it really can be impactful to the business. Um, we talked about the, the gain in productivity 3x uh, for those uh, using it 90% of the time. Uh, and so, you know, I think, I think the big takeaway here is that you have to have uh, integrations built with uh, other systems um, and it has to really uh, kind of become the Bible of the, of the salesperson today. Uh, they don't need to go think about it anymore. They don't wait, waste five minutes here, two minutes here 
30 seconds here. End of the day, if you add up all of the time they just spend thinking, you know, in some organizations, anywhere from an hour to two hours, and then you layer in all of the things we're doing as well as it relates to uh, transferring them the customer, they don't even make the phone calls at some points anymore, uh, pre recorded voicemails, all this other stuff that we can start to chip away at a salesperson's day to give them an extra hour or two every day to sell more. And I think that's the key piece. So we do see some questions. Um, I think. Uh, I guess we'll come back to those, Hector, because they're on some of the previous slides. We'll come back at the end and, and answer the questions, um, but keep sending those in, so I appreciate those. Hector, anything to add for prioritization before we jump on? No, the, the one thing that I would add, and we can dig into this at a, at a later date, but um, you, know, you can also begin to leverage what we refer to as lead scoring into the system. And so you, you can start, I mean, there's a ton of ways that you can um, you know, create lead scoring in your priority view. Um, but effectively, what it, it allows you to do is it gives you the flexibility to, um, you know, take a look at data attributes on the, the lead record and then score it. And so, you know, if you kind of think about, let's say, you know, two records in, uh, you know, contact status, you know, one of them, you know, may have, uh, you know, certain attributes that, you know, potentially are better than the others. And so you want to rank that higher in your priority view. And so that allows you to give you the flexibility to rank not only by, uh, you know, the, the most recently created record or the most important one, but then you can add another dynamic there uh, to rank by, you know, lead score. And so, you know, what, what Scott and I have also, you know, started to look at is giving uh, the, the salesperson the flexibility to have a little bit of control over the priority view really does go a long way. And so what you want to do is, is start to put in uh, attributes like lead flagging into your priority view or, you know, maybe some sort of action or whatnot that would boost the score just a little bit. So that way, if they're looking at their priority view, um, they have a way of overriding that. If they feel that they need to like call an audible, if we're going to kind of continue that, that quarterback analogy and, and take that lead out of a certain strategy and maybe accelerate it or decelerate it based off of something that they're seeing. So, you know, when it comes to priority view, there's a lot of different ways that you can expand on the use of it. And we've seen the organizations that do the best and have the best uh, you know, uh, customer experience and also uh, production really heavily uh, layer in some of these strategies into the priority view. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up lead score just to mention real quick there as well is that <clears throat> lead score is typically, you know, uh, you know, scored before the lead comes into the system. There's services out there and you run through a model and it gives you a score. So when the lead comes into the system, you have that score and, you know, Velocify can do that as well. We could take data points uh, and score. But what I think is, is kind of the up and coming thing is that, you use lead scoring for not just the attributes of the lead, but also for the, how the customer has engaged with you to that point. Meaning if you send them an email and they open it, that should have a, a, you know, an increased value of conversion for that customer. They're more likely to convert if they've read your content. Now, if they've clicked on a link, that's even more valuable, right? Now they've gone to a landing page, they've learned more about, about your company. Uh, and so what we're finding a lot is, and we're recommending a lot is that you should use uh, the borrower's engagement into that lead score so that if I'm following up people, I'm looking at not only the leads that had a high score originally or the data points look good, but they're also engaged with my content. So it gets even more valuable as you get into like nurtured leads and, and following up on things there as you get to the call screeners uh, who are making outbound calls. Uh, they're, they're making calls and, and they're focused on those scores, the highest scores first, and ultimately it's going to drive uh, better conversion rates. And we're seeing this all across the board. Awesome. So I'm going to jump into the, to the third point here, um, which is called a lead snipers. It's just a term that talks about, um, you know, there's other, other ways to say, you could say a save team, a rehash team could be a team of people. Uh, I recommend you at least have one person that is, uh, that's on your team, that's on the sales team, uh, that's, that's going to, to do these things we talk about here. Um, so, Let's talk about a sniper in the military. So graduates of the U.S. Army Sniper School, they're expected to hit 90% of the targets they shoot at. These guys are really good. The average number of rounds ex uh, expended by U.S. military snipers to kill an enemy soldier is 1.3 rounds, so they don't miss very often. Um, so they're not only snipers because they're not only snipers because they're good at shooting. Um, only 20% of sniper school is actual shooting. So Army snipers must be well-rounded in other areas such as stalking, detecting a target, estimating range of target. So how does this relate to your organization? Um, everyone needs that lead sniper I talked about, but they're the sales team whose entire job is going out to find opportunities that other salespeople have missed. Um, they're going to be your most experienced people in the organization. They have a deep knowledge of your products. They're really good at fighting through objections and they're obviously, they're, they have to be really well respected within your organization. So let's talk about what they do. 
they're really going to help you sales and marketing uh, sleep better at night, really in the day, because they're going to squeeze every dollar you spend on marketing. They're going to squeeze it out. Okay. Here's the other key thing with the lead snipers. They have to not really give a blank about what other people think about them. They're not, they don't care about hurting people's feelings. They only want to see the company's success. So if you think of through your sales organization today, do you have anybody like this? Do you have somebody who just doesn't care? They just go out and they want to be successful and they want to see the, the company be successful as well. These are the people you can trust to do the right thing. You're going to give access to the lead snipers to things that normal users wouldn't have. They're going to have the ability to listen to phone calls. They're going to have the ability to call leads that are owned by other people. But the key thing is, is that now that you've set up a prioritization strategy that you need to hold everyone accountable to, the way to hold them accountable is that the customer or that the, uh, the salesperson knows that the lead sniper is going to be finding those missed opportunities. So they're right kind of on their doorstep. If you miss an opportunity, I'm going to find it and I'm going to convert it. So they find leads assigned to reps who aren't following up. Another key thing is missed appointments. If you miss an appointment, you don't call the customer back on time, lead sniper snaps in, he gets a notification, he's calling within five minutes if you're not on the phone with the customer. Um, if you neglect your lead, you're not gonna you know, let it sit for, if you have a prioritization rule that says it needs to be called in an hour, you better call in an hour because he's gonna call it you know, an hour and a half later or 30 minutes after when you were supposed to call it. And I wish I could do show of hands here, um, but, um, how many people on the call today have salespeople who call in sick or take vacation, right? It happens a lot. And what happens to, the, to those, persons, those people's leads whenever they call in sick and the, and the appointments they have scheduled? Now you have a built-in way to make sure that no leads go unworked. You have your snipers calling them uh, right away. Now, lastly, I'll bring up this last point. I've seen a couple of organizations do this and it's been phenomenal. They, you know, they hire a lot of salespeople coming in. They'll train them up. They'll learn the process, maybe they're experienced, maybe they're not, but the idea is that they're brand new to the organization. So what we've set up is the ability for a lead sniper to go in and find all of the leads that have been actioned is not interested or doesn't qualify from someone who started with your organization within, within the last 90 days. So you can write distribution rules around this, so they can see these records. And they're doing the second voice, calling and trying to snipe these away. Hey, they didn't, they didn't know about this product we have, or they didn't know to, to mention this, or they didn't know how this guideline worked yet. And so for you, the marketer and the sales team, you know that you're squeezing the most out of every dollar that you spend in your marketing uh, because you have this lead sniper right behind it. Hector, anything to add, lead snipers? Yeah, so we, we, it's, it's a really interesting um, you know, kind of type of person or, or, or team that would fulfill this role. You know, one other thing to think about, so not only you know, does it take a certain person to do the right thing and have a certain attitude, um, but the other part of it is this notion of a, a second voice and, and, you know, not only, you know, a second voice kind of right away, we've almost seen a cooling off period for a lot of organizations or, or I'm sorry, customers where, you know, a customer puts in an inquiry, they talk to a ton of people and they just kind of get inundated with a ton of information everybody's a little bit different, but it's all kind of the same, you know, that type of thing. And so they just kind of give up. And so they may say no to everybody. I'm just want some time to think about it. And that's where this lead sniper, if you do have it implemented and, and you implement it well, could roll back around right about the right time. You know, typically we see about four, 10 to 14 days after the initial inquiry. And so they, they roll back around, reach back out to the customer and begin to have that heart to heart conversation again with them saying, Hey, what, you know, what happened the first time? You know, why, why didn't you decide to, to go with us? Or if, they, if you're actively working with one of our competitors, be able to sell against that competition. And so with organizations, again, that we've seen implement this well, uh, these team members are actually some of the highest producing uh, uh, team members. And if you think about it, they're not calling any new leads. They're literally just going through all of your existing pipeline and, and recalling, you know, those, those customers. Um, you know, and, and there's, there's uh, again, a, a ton of uh, you know, other things that you can be in to implement with lead screen, uh, uh, snipers in that if you are emailing and maybe texting after, you know, a customer has either we've lost contact with them or they've turned us down or whatnot, if you stay in front of them through some sort of communication, you know, we can get that uh, in Velocify, we can get that uh, trigger back saying, hey, this person's opened up an email. We can prioritize that or flag that in some sort of uh, pull blind program or pull preview program with this lead sniper can go in and, and, and call that record while somebody's even opening up that email. So a lot of different things that you can do with lead snipers, but it's a great point, something that, that everybody should take a look at. Awesome. So Hector, you want to do a quick summary, summary real quick? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, let's take a look oh, at. Sorry, there. You got it there. Here All we right. go. Yep. All right. So uh, you know the first takeaway, right? So take the technology wave and and really how generations are adapting, um, you know, and kind of you know to to some of these influences is going to change the way that we do business, right? So. You know, the sales process has to, you know, evolve with some of these changes. And, and during this pandemic, I think a lot of organizations were forced into that. And we've seen a lot of organizations do very well with some of the technology and other, other organizations that maybe have the right technology, but they just haven't implemented uh, in, in the right way. So, you know, really taking a look at winning, you know, with this modern kind of salesperson is really two way street, right? So you have to support your salespeople with you know, additional kind of human resources and they have to be held accountable you know, with their follow-up or, or, or their, you know, kind of lose their, their customer first mentality, right? Um, and so, you know, the last thing here is that the prior, power prioritization is something that's tried and true. We've seen that over and over and over again over, you know, the last few years and with organizations that put a key focus into building out prioritization and constantly change as the market changes, as, as salespeople changes, as rates change, right? You have to constantly be adapting and updating your, your prioritization, uh, you know, strategy for organization. Uh, but, you know, really puts the focus on the right customer at the right time. And for the, the loan officer, the salesperson, you know, prioritizes record at the right time for them, uh, which is a very powerful thing. So, you know, good news, you know, here is that uh, these are all things that you can do relatively easily in your, in this case, your philosophy environment. Um, you know, one of the things that Scott and I really do work with organizations on quite a bit is you know going through some sort of assessment, looking at your current system, and understanding is this the right thing you know for us? Do we have it configured the right way? We may have had something out of the box and may have worked well you know a few years ago, but with the way that the, the markets change, the economies change, your salespeople are now you know remote. You know looking back and and being able to adapt to that and change that in your priority queue can be a very powerful tool uh, to your organization. And again, it's something that doesn't take a ton of time, doesn't take a, a, a lot of effort. Um, but it, you know, something that can be done relatively quickly and you can get the, the, the gain from it uh, in a fast way. Yeah, and to add that, you know, one of the things we do a lot as well is we, we do what's called a customer experience screen where we'll go in and actually seek or chop your process. We put a lead on your website and we track phone calls, emails, and texts over a 10 day period. We even call back in uh, to the salesperson loan officer and act like we're interested for a, a brief moment and then ask you know, for a call back the next day because you know, I have to take my kid somewhere. And so we then track again for another 10, 10 days. How do they follow up? And so there's, there's amazing stats we've come up with from this on, you know, confirm a lot of the stuff we see here, you know, as kind of as an industry on how fast people respond to, you know, I think one of the biggest takeaways we have is how do your sales reps or loan officers follow up with contacted customers? Are they following up on time? And I'll tell you through all of the studies I've done, 85% of the time uh, when I've requested a call back, I don't get, uh, I don't get a call back on time. I mean, it's just crazy how, how much missed opportunities there are. So you got to be putting things in place. You always got to be adapting. And that's where these assessments and, and these experience screens that we do can be super valuable to organizations. So that said, you know, segue into how do you contact us? You know, here's our information. I mentioned the Lead Management Masterminds podcast. Hector will be on an up, up, upcoming episode with me as well. We have 12 episodes now. There's a 13th coming out later today or later tomorrow. Um, but all kinds of different guests in the industry around lead management and best practices and these types of things. Here's Hector's information as well. Um, Hector, anything to add? I know we have some questions to go through real quick. Anything else to add on how to contact you? No, I think it's the best, you know, best way is, uh, you know, shoot me an email if you, you know, have any questions on any of your LMA products, we can get you in touch with the right person. Um, you know, and I, I think the, you know, just kind of the last thing that I would say is, you know, some of the organizations that Scott and I have worked with over the years is, one of those things where you start to build a relationship and, and you know, build, uh, you know, some trust there. And so at the end of the day, it's all, you know, kind of, a, you know, being a trusted advisor uh, in, in our book. And, you know, I would uh, encourage everyone on the call to, you know, listen into Scott's uh, podcast. I'll, I'll be on, uh, you know, in, in, in about a week or two here. Uh, but Scott's podcast is great. You know, a lot of the, the people that he brings on, you know, really do come from, uh, you know, different kind of backgrounds in the industry, uh, but just a ton of great information there. Awesome. All right, let's jump into a couple of questions. So first question from the app was, how do you, how do you effectively balance customer experience with a call screener strategy? Do customers get frustrated being passed around and does it take away from the customer service experience? So I, I, I'll take the first shot here. At the yeah, go ahead. So uh, great question. 
um, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we do here is that, you know, that, that the bounce around, so to speak, or the transfer is really frictionless. Um, and so, you know, when we do implement it, you know, one of the things would be that, you know, the, the call screener gets right to the point, you know, uh, we, we begin to talk with the customer, you know, begin to gain that trust, make sure that we have, uh, you know, all the right information. Uh, but it's crucial that when we you know, initiate that transfer, um, that, that we don't put them on hold. And so I think that's where that bad experience can begin to come from because, you know, you, you started to create a, a relationship with a customer, you started to gain some trust, maybe the two people on the call had some sort of, uh, you know, connection or they're vibing well or whatnot, and then you go and put them on hold. And then you hear hold music, and then that, you know, let's say that that's more than 30 seconds, one, two, you get into one or two minutes, all of a sudden, that's when you create that kind of bad experience and you could lose you know, the, the customer there. So, you know, one of the ways reducing the friction is to not place the customer on hold and, and, and implement the no hold uh, transfer. Um, you know, on, on the other side of, you know, things, I, I would say it's probably a little bit of a better experience um, for, for some organizations. And the reason being is that, you know, that, that call screener is really focused in on introducing the customer to the company, you know, taking the time that they need uh, you know, to answer their questions or whatnot. And so sometimes we see salespeople may, may not necessarily have the time to do that, or the customer is, you know, has to wait on hold for a while to actually get a hold of someone. So that call screen role is really focused in on, you know, kind of, you know, introducing the cu uh, customer to the organization, kind of a soft sell approach or whatnot. Once we gain that trust, make sure we do the no hold transfer and get them to hands of a, uh, a seasoned or a licensed loan, loan officer. Yeah. Uh, one thing to add there is that you know, as we, I don't know how much we talked through the process here, but essentially you, uh, call screeners on the phone, they know they get to a point in the conversation where it's probably going, going to lead to a transfer. They go ahead and start the, the, the race, if you will. So it goes out, we shotgun it to a, to a rep, a loan officer, uh, the first person to answer wins, they, they pick up their phone and now the loan officer's placed on hold. They're hearing hold music. But what's, what's great about the, the way it works is that when they're in Velocify as the example here, the, the call actually, the lead go ahead is pops up on their screen essentially. And they can start to review the information on the lead record while they're on hold. So they don't come in to the conversation not knowing what's going on. They already know all of the notes this person's entered and hit save. It's now right there at their fingertips for them to be able to uh, start familiarizing themselves with that customer so that when they jump on the phone, they're able to, to really speak intelligently about some of the things they've already talked about. All right, next question from the app. Have you seen improvements in contact rates during this time? Is email, text, or call more effective than others during these times? And I'll start here. Uh, actually, um, yeah, I'm seeing that email open rates have, op have uh, dramatically gone up, um, especially in the, in the early on part of the period. Um, you know, a lot, a lot more people checking their emails. And so those open rates went up. Interestingly enough, though, I'm hearing from a lot of my clients that I work with that their phone contact rates have actually gone down in most cases. Um, I'm not sure what that is. I don't, you know, maybe there's too many distractions at, at home with, uh, with no activities, no school, these types of things. Um, but, you know, I've seen that, uh, that phone contact rates have gone down. So that just means you have to have, you know, a lot of organizations today aren't utilizing that omni-channel approach. It's really just phone calls. And so are they taking the, the hit because they don't have the SMS built in uh, or the, the really defined email strategy? So Hector, any, uh, anything to add there? Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, a few things. So, you know, to Scott's point, um, we're seeing, you know, great results with organizations that are doing a good job of, of some sort of nurture uh, email campaign, whether or not that's, hey, we couldn't get a hold of you or, or a customer first inquired. Um, you know, and, and being able to kind of brand your, your organization, differentiate your, your organization from the others. Um, so we're, we're seeing really great results from that. And then more importantly, if someone does open it or, or whatnot, um, you know, getting that information back into Velocity, prioritizing the record, um, has been uh, a success for a lot of organizations. What I would say the most success that we've seen, um, you know, lately is is incorporating text messaging. Um, so maybe not necessarily, you know, right off the bat doing the text text messaging, but you know, once you have uh, established uh, some sort of contact with the customer, you've talked with them. We've seen great results from texting uh, customers for a few things. So the first is, hey, you know, we set up a you know meeting uh, time at you know three thirty on Monday. So send them the, the reminder, maybe 30 minutes or an hour before the call, just to remind them, hey, we still have a, you know, a, a meeting. Are you on? If you need to change it, let's change it, right? So being able to remind them for that. The other important thing there is uh, maybe even following up with the customer after the application. So you know, in the mortgage uh, you know, world, there's a ton of things that you need to do after an application is started. 
And so being able to email or text when, it, it, you know, maybe the application has kind of fallen through the cracks or customer hasn't given us documents or they haven't signed something. And so being able to leverage some of these tools to communicate with your customers is a really great way to do something without having to you know, get them on the phone and, and have an actual conversation with them. You can just shoot them a you know, quick text, whether or not that's automated through the system, or if it's just someone, you know, a manual uh, you know, text message that, that uh, the loan officer sends out to the customer. Awesome. So we have time for one last question. Uh, and the question is, what is the most noticeable change you've seen with mortgage conversions or how companies are managing their leads, positive or negative, since the quarantine be began? And uh, you know, one of the things that I've seen um, companies really take advantage of, something we've been preaching for a while is around um, you know, stri striking why the iron is hot. There's a, a white paper that was done by Velocify years ago that talked about the value of leads that are received after hours and on weekends. And, you know, consumer direct lenders have struggled with this for many years, trying to get salespeople to come in the office and, and do these things uh, on the weekend or taking calls after hours. Now that they're working from home, why not? They can work Saturdays and Sundays and they can respond to these leads fast. And so we're seeing across the board, a lot of organizations now, you know, distributing leads on Saturdays and Sundays and, and distributing leads at, you know, nine o'clock at night, um, you know, if they're on the central time and then they got to call the West Coast. So doing those things to, to make sure you're still responding uh, to the customer, even though they're responding later over the weekend, can have a dramatic effect on the conversion rate for those lead records. All right, Michael, see you back. You're on mute. Hey, Michael, we can't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to hit the unmute. So we have one last question. I, I, mean, I wonder if we, can, if we can do it in two minutes, that'd be super awesome just to address it. Um, if not, we can reach out to the person on the app. But um, are there any particular tactics with regards to this lead sniper, which is a phenomenal idea, I love it, that work better than others to reapproach potential clients uh, lost to competition? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think that the uh, lead sniper is typically going to be the experienced person in your team, right? And, they, and they've, you know, maybe they've been with a couple of other lenders before and they know how other things work with other lenders. Uh, and so they can utilize that and their kind of tool belt and how they, how they follow up and how they approach that customer. It's not just like, like, you know, I know that customers are, I know that the competition's telling you this, but I can tell you from my experience that, you know, whatever. So if you can find someone like that, I mean, I really think that the biggest key thing is that, you need an experienced person who, who people look up to and, and they don't really care. I think that's the key part. They don't care what people think. They're not going to say, well, I don't want to call, you know, Susie's lead because we're friends and we go out, you know, uh, for drinks after work. You know, you've really got to just kind of take, take that away and, you know, hey, I'm trying to do the best thing with the company. Uh, and uh, yeah, anything to add there, Hector? Yeah, so just, just two quick things. So, uh, you know, a t some sort of title um, is always – there's something that like a tactic that, that we've seen successful, either it's some sort of manager or retention title or whatnot. It, it just kind of gives that borrower a, a sense of the, Hey, I'm not talking about just the loan officer. I think it's just loan officers. Right. But, but all of a sudden, you know, customers do recognize that. And then the second would be empower them. So empower them to, if there's some sort of deal, some sort of offer that you want to give to them as one last, uh, you know, ditch attempt, you know, give that to them. So, you know, title and empowerment, give them a, a you know, a good, good, uh, good, good runway. Awesome. Both great ideas. I love that. Um, yep. Well, thank you. And if there's any other questions that we missed and folks that will review this uh, recording and watch it later, um, you know, you got Scott um, and Hector's information up there. So you please feel free to reach out to them. But otherwise, thank you gentlemen for joining us uh, today and sharing the information it was awesome. And uh, we'll catch up with you guys later.